thank you for joining today. And um, today is our big day because you know we've been it's been five months since we launched um, everything ALS platform. And uh, today we have you know over uh, 200 people join our sessions, and sometimes we've had over 400 people. And um, today we are bringing in another exciting offering um, called Caring ALS. And I would like to introduce Sarah, Dr. Clive Spenson, who is the head and founder of Spetson Labs at Cedar Mount Sinai. He has 30 years of experience and expertise in innovating stem cell research. And he has come tonight to talk to us about regenerative medicine and stem cell therapy for ALS. It was an amazing story. And uh, really, uh, I think it's gonna be transformational what you're doing. I, I've, I've talked to many patients in the early stages and uh, that's just incredible. So very exciting, congratulations on launching that. And I think one of the, things patients really miss is where to get information and that's very very hard and I think nowhere is that harder than in in the stem cell world um, where I live and this is uh, actually we're not Mount Sinai we're Cedar Sinai in Los Angeles um, we're I'm in this building here I'm looking out of one of those windows somewhere um, and uh, the hospital here is <coughs> set at, at the hospital at Cedar Sinai to uh, study um, healthcare, obviously, we're a, we're a critical hospital for the region, but we do a lot of biomedical research and we do a lot of education. Uh, we have over 14,000 staff here, over 1,000 beds. And really the, the cool thing about this center is we can take bench to bedside. It means I can do an experiment in the lab uh, as a scientist and then work with clinicians here and take that into the clinic. And that's a remarkable uh, ability. And I'll share that with you tonight. Um, <clears throat> focus in four different areas. I'm going to start with introduction. Um, I'll then sort of maybe follow on from Dr. Rothstein, who I think you all heard from if, uh, if you went a few, a few weeks ago, uh, about how we can use stem cells, not to treat ALS, which you hear about a lot, but to model it and understand more about the disease. I'll then try to tell you about this uh, organ on chip technology, which combined with stem cells, I think is going to be moving things forward. And even a new collaboration with NASA that we have, which, uh, you can wait for that one. That's an exciting part coming up. And I'm going to finish off with our uh, stem cell and gene therapy combined approach uh, that we just finished here at Cedar Sinai and give you a, a taste of the information uh, that came out of that stem cell trial. <clears throat> so here's uh, an introduction to stem cells. And, and maybe you've all heard of embryonic stem cells. Uh, this is the embryo, the blastocyst, where it gets to about nine days. Uh, this, and this little blue mass of cells inside this tiny blastocyst is what makes a whole human being. A number of years ago, about 10 years ago, Jamie Thompson, a colleague of mine when I was at the University of Wisconsin, isolated these embryonic stem cells. And these are the most powerful cells in the world. You can grow them indefinitely in the Petri dish. They're pluripotent, which means they can make any of these three cell types, heart cells, brain cells, even immune cells. And of course, we're interested because they can make motor neurons, and these are the neurons that die in ALS. So imagine being able to take a cell in the lab and convert it into the very neuron that dies in the disease we're all interested in. Well, added to that, there was a lot of ethical issues uh, during the Bush uh, era. And in fact, I moved to California. I moved for a number of reasons. First, my wife didn't like the frozen tundra uh, in Wisconsin, and so she was interested in California. That's where she's from. But secondly, they have CERM, the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, which actually gave $3 billion to the state of California for stem cell research, focusing on diseases like ALS. And the magic technology that happened about eight years ago uh, is this uh, technology where we don't need embryos anymore. Uh, and this was uh, absolutely remarkable. So we can take an adult person, a patient with ALS, we take their skin cells, we hit them with certain compounds or drugs, and remarkably they go back in time to a pluripotent state. So now we've got an adult who now we have the cells in the Petri dish that are what we call pluripotent. And these cells are pretty much identical to embryonic stem cells. And this is just, when it happened, this is uh, for, for us is, is rather like turning lead into gold. Where lead is your old cells, you can now reprogram them and turn them into new cells. This has massive implications for biology and medicines. Uh, we can generate young tissue from old patients. Uh, they're perfectly matched to you. So uh, if we can transplant them back in and replace cells, we, we can do that without them rejecting, theoretically. And uh, we can also model diseases, because now we have your neurons in the dish. Normally, I can't get neurons from you. <laughs> you need those for thinking. 
now we can get neurons, we can't do a biopsy of the brain model. And um, that's really, really been important. The person who discovered this uh, from Japan, Shinya Yamanaka, got the Nobel Prize. This is how powerful this IPS technology is. The ability to take cells back in time to an embryonic state, won the Nobel Prize in record time. Normally you've got to be in your 90s before you get one of those gold discs. Uh, he got it in, in a super quick time. Here's Lou Gehrig's disease. I uh, don't have to tell you all about this. Um, there's only two drugs on the market right now, uh, Rilazol and Deverone. <clears throat> they aren't cures for ALS. They delay a little bit, but it's really not enough, as we all know. 10% are familial of ALS, uh, which have genes like you've heard of, SOD1, C9-ORF, C9-ORF being the most prevalent. But 90% of cases, we don't know what causes ALS. Have no clue. There's lots of ideas, we just don't know. If you don't know the cause of a disease, how can you develop drugs to fight it? And also I'll note that there are two neurons that make your muscles move. One is up here in your motor cortex that goes all the way down your spinal cord to the lower, in this case, to the leg region. And the second motor neuron then goes out to the muscle and allows you to have movement. And I just want to keep those in mind, those two cell types. I've had a, a long career in ALS. Uh, this is probably the most scary moment in my career when we had a visitor, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, and I show this for a number of reasons. One is, you know, I was obviously super excited. He spent the day here back in 2013 at Cedars and he came to kick the tires on our stem cell program. But I also say it for, for kind of be careful uh, in the news because actually the, uh, the listing was completely wrong. It says Stephen Hawking listens to Robert Bailow um, and Clive Svensson uh, is watching. And actually this is me, Clive, and this is Bob Bailow. Um, but it's quite nice, uh, the, the reporting got it wrong, sometimes happens, but we were both there. Uh, and Bob Balo is gonna come up later on as he was the uh, PI for our clinical trial that we did the stem cell trial here in, in Los Angeles. I also like it here, this is my wife Shana from California back here watching as well uh, when Hawking was here for the day. So what is disease in a dish and, and, and how are we gonna use this modeling? It's exactly what you think. We take the cells, iPS cells, and we push them in, in the dish to, to be neurons. And perhaps you've all heard of C9-ORF. This is where you get these repeats in your DNA, abnormal repeats in this gene. And don't worry what that means. It's just bad DNA. And, and it repeats itself over and over again in your DNA in a specific region, and it leads to ALS. And what we did very early on, a very simple experiment. We said, well, if we take patients that have this mutation, we turn the cells, here into iPS cells first, and then we turn them into the motor neurons, what happens? And the answer is, we see differences. So in these motor neurons, we started seeing ALS features of C9 ORF. And in fact, the changes were so similar, um, the, the changes in the cells, uh, people have started using those now to develop drugs just from the uh, cell biology, and you can actually put drugs on and see if it changes the C9 ORF phenotype in the cells. And in fact, one of the experiments that was done there actually went all the way to a clinical trial uh, run by Kevin Egan uh, in, in Boston. And so we, we're using this modeling and to, to understand how to generate new models of disease with, with cells in the dish. So we're all very excited about this, um, but this is a genetic mutation. What about all the sporadic cases? And how about the cells? I mean, I showed you here very simple cells in two dimensions. Well, you can actually grow the cells in three dimensions. These are actually done by a graduate student in my lab. These are called organoids. So these are mini brains. And so these are all structures in the brain starting to develop in these little clumps in the petri dish. Kind of scary. These clumps are actually mini human brains. I figure when they start, you know, reading New York Times, they've really matured. If they get to people, they're halfway there. Uh, but they do have some inherent ability to uh, fire action potentials, signals that the nervous system creates. So you're creating mini brains. So these are all great. And actually, if you put them in the dish and you watch their activity, you can see them actually firing in front of you. So these neurons can fire, they can, like they do in your brain and spinal cord. And this is what, this is what happens in neurons to create movement. So we're very excited about these models. We've done a lot of work in this area. And, and the idea really is to look at the motor neurons that we've made from patients and do lots of different analysis. We look at the genome sequence of the cell We'll look at the proteins that are around and all the RNA. And through all of this, we'll understand what goes wrong in ALS. And through knowing exactly what goes wrong, we can target new drugs. And I think this is an incredibly exciting area. Uh, it's developing fast. And Jeff Rothstein, 
uh, I'll go very quickly here because he already described answer ALS. This is really uh, disease modeling on steroids. And we got together, Jeff and I, and Merit Jakovic, who you've also heard from, uh, at a meeting that was actually funded by Steve Gleason uh, in New Orleans about six years ago, and came up with this idea that we could maybe answer ALS and come up with what causes it in sporadic patients through this, this uh, IPS modeling that I've talked about. And we've now actually collected 1,000 patients already. Um, this, uh, this, this patient blood will go to the New York Genome Center, so we get the patient's whole genome. And then I would say that this is the Genome Center building, and then this is a remarkably similar building, but in green, and this is Cedar sinai And the same blood sample then we make iPS cells from, the magic cells, and turn them into, into motor neurons. And we also collect all the patient clinical data. And all of this information from a thousand patients goes into this uh, data analytics where we're trying to generate these signatures of ALS. And I think someone mentioned just before that ALS is not one disease. It's probably maybe four dis different subtypes. And I've depicted this in colors here where these are four different types of ALS. We don't know it because we can't tell. It all looks the same clinically. But when you do the molecular profiling, <clears throat> uh, we can distinguish these four subtypes. And we've had a lot of help from people like Google, IBM. But this is an enormous amount of data. I think Jeff tends to say it's more data than stars in the universe. And trying to make sense of all this has been challenging, but we're really working with, uh, with also with uh, Microsoft, with all the names you could think of, and Indu has been fantastic in linking us up now with more high tech and, and bioinformatics people in, in San Francisco and, and Northern California. And I think through all of this, the goal really is to find these subtypes, understand what is in, interesting about the subtypes molecularly and, uh, and targets, and then develop drugs. And I have to thank my son for this uh, 10 years ago. I never knew how to you know, do, do these transformations. But this is the right drug for the right patient. That should have flown across your screen. So now we'll test a patient that comes in new with ALS. We'll get their molecular signature, and, they'll, and we'll say, oh, you're in the green group. You need the green drug. And in order to get there, we have to finish off this big answer ALS project. And we're, we're halfway through collection. Uh, of, of the motor neurons, um, but while we're going along, we're actually providing information back to the researchers and we're starting to build a very good uh, data set from this interesting group. Uh, just to show you how, how widely collaborative this is, I think we just hit on all the uh, interesting people in ALS uh, from the research side have, got, have joined in. It's a massive effort. No one group could do this. Um, it's based on a $50 million funding um, across all these in interesting foundations. And of course, uh, everything ALS uh, has, has also uh, been involved with Indu joining us on the board of ANSWER. And so we've been very appreciative of all the support that we've had. So that's all very exciting. Uh, and you heard from a little bit about that last, uh, the last time um, Jeff talked about this. But how can we make things more physiologically relevant? Because cells in a dish aren't really the brain. And here I turn to a colleague of mine at the Wiss Institute at Harvard called Don Ingber, who was developing these organ chip systems. And in the middle of this organ chip, which is about the size of a, a thumb drive, you have a membrane which you can seed cells to. And this one, you see lung cells on the top, and you put blood capillary cells on the bottom. This is a remarkable chip that I just talked about an hour before this meeting at a COVID meeting, where you can actually create real lung tissue. I'm showing the lung on a chip. I'll show you a brain on a chip in a minute. What's fascinating is if you have this lung tissue on the top, you can run air through it and you simulate the lung. And now you can run patient blood through the bottom of this chip. And what happens then uh, is, and this is just gonna be a cartoon, looking at the sideways onto the chip. So here are all the, there's connections between the blood side is down here. And in this case, the lung side. And here's COVID infection. So imagine COVID coming on the top of your lung. And this is simulated. We can simulate the infection and the blood cells going by, these are your immune cells, will go through these small pores and attack the COVID virus on the top. So in other words, we can mimic this whole sequence using these chips for COVID. So we asked some time ago, can we also do this for ALS? And the answer is clearly yes, otherwise I wouldn't have built out this huge uh, thing for you. Uh, we've now made iPS cells, I mentioned, into both blood brain, uh, into uh, endothelial cells. These are basically blood vessel cells shown in the bottom channel. And then we make them into motor neurons in the top channel. And you're looking at the video there, this is actually honing in on the chip 
and looking at the cells actually growing within that chip device. This is actually a, an amazing technology. We can create a blood brain barrier. And what's really cool with this is we can put the ALS blood on one side of the chip, and then we can see what that blood does uh, or, the, or drugs in it to the brain side, thus simulating ALS. So we can now test drugs on these chips and see if they, uh, if they affect the brain side of the chip. And I'm, I'm very excited by this technology. I don't have time to go into a lot of details uh, with you, but I can ask questions uh, when we finish. Um, but there is a big interest in this area. Um, I think this is my, my, my most fun front cover was the National Geographic uh, last uh, January. Um, and this is my graduate student's hand, now famous, where he, this is one of these chips uh, that I'm talking about. And they, they really feel that this, this uh, effort, and these are actually uh, neurons here from, from a patient in white are the neurons in the background of uh, this, this cover article. And the idea is this, this, can, this kind of chip technology can take us to another level, right? I mean, they're not just cells in a dish anymore. They're actually cells that are integrated into a chip that you can apply patient blood to, and you can look at very carefully how drugs interact with the brain in a physiologically relevant system. So we're analyzing at the moment sporadic ALS and control ALS. We're starting to see very interesting biomarkers pop up, um, some of which we expected, some of which we didn't. And once we have these biomarkers and validate them, we can understand what caused ALS in those patients because some of them are turning out to be more specific to certain patient types. And then we can administer our drugs to the blood channel to see if we can uh, get rid of this uh, problem. Now, I'll just add, we, we, I, my feeling on neurodegenerative diseases is unfortunately, by the time you come to the clinic with foot drop or problems, you've already had a lot of advancing issues in your nervous system. So it would be great to understand earlier or very early in the disease process um, what type of ALS you have. Uh, and if we could actually screen patients, and this is sort of uh, hoping, looking forward in medicine, if we could screen patients who are at risk, so if you have a family member with ALS or you're at a higher risk for ALS, if we could screen you early on and tell with these biomarkers you are going to get it, then we could try preventive medicine over time and give you molecules which could stop the progression of the disease. And I think of this as like a Lipitor for ALS. And I, I went to the heart doctor about four years ago and he said, my cholesterol's too high. He looked at my heart vessel and I'm accumulating a little bit of calcium on my vessel. And he said, well, you've got to take Lipitor to prevent that. And now I see my vessels cleaning up. Um, if I hadn't taken Lipitor, I would have had a major heart attack when I was in my 70s. Uh, and I think it's the same for neurological diseases. These models can let us understand very early what is causing your disease so that we can then apply preventive techniques um, in the future. And, and we hope through these technologies, we'll have a new generation of, of folks who, who are taking preventive medicine for diseases like ALS. And we're working in Parkinson's as well. Some of our challenges, guys, is, uh, is growing these cells. They're very difficult to grow, they're slow. And so we noticed um, that one of the issues is gravity and the cells stick down and they, they don't want to grow anymore. And so uh, at a meeting I was at with, a, in, in, with someone from NASA, it's a long story, and they said, well, Clive, why don't you apply for a grant? because we can take these cells up to the space station and uh, look at them there and see how they grow with no gravity. And I thought it was a joke initially, and then it turned out he was very high up in NASA uh, and a company called Space Tango. So long story short, we applied for a grant about two years ago. We've been working with NASA. Uh, very recently, uh, actually April this year, uh, we got a large grant from NASA of a million dollars to um, manufacture stem cells here and then take them up uh, on SpaceX, the first shuttle is going, uh, first uh, SpaceX launches in March, and see how they grow up on the space station with the space astronauts, uh, and then see if we can enhance further our ability to make these cells and, and differentiate them into motor neurons. Uh, here's the space station, then, which is, has always has five astronauts on it floating around space. And of course, with the new, uh, with the new manned approach now, we'll get more astronauts going up there. And ultimately, we'd like to have manufacturing in space, and we're still working on um, uh, we have a lot of work to do before we get there, but it may be we growing cells up there is going to be better. So I'm going to switch gears now. I've talked about how we can use cells for modeling. Innovative technology is going to make these models more real and actually getting close to having a, what we call a molecular twin or a cellular twin of the patient in the petri dish or in the chip that we can test drugs on. So that's all very exciting, but what about a therapy? And of course, stem cells is, um, has been very interesting. I've been working in stem cells for almost 30 years. So in my parallel life for stem cells, while I'm 
turning them into all these interesting cell types, I've been working out, well, how can we replace cells in the spinal cord of ALS patients or in the brain uh, to treat this disorder? And of course, I'm challenged a little bit by, by this field because immediately you get into the stem cell field, uh, you get this issue, which I'm going to have three stages here. One is the snake oil. And it's, it's, it's a little like whack-a-mole. Uh, you, 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 you get these guys, you, you punch them down with the FDA, and then they pop up as another name. And this is a good example. <clears throat> this is a company who were around about six years ago. They claimed they could cure anything uh, with strange stem cells. They didn't really define where they were from. Um, and, and people would flock to them. The only common thing to all these places is $40,000, which is about the amount of money you can get on a credit card uh, without mortgaging your house. And, and most of these were charlatans. The same company popped up again as Medra, um, this guy, uh, William Radder, uh, which was also uh, then has now gone again because they really had nothing. Uh, they were just preying on people with, with serious diseases. I think this has been one of the saddest things about stem cells is that you know, patients go out looking and they come across all these things on the internet and you just don't know what, you know, what it is. So I think just like we heard before, uh, you know, there, is, there are places you can go and find good information. I'll, I can talk to people about it afterwards. I, the International um, Stem Cell Society is one, um, but that, the, the, they change so quickly, it's, it's hard to keep up to date. The second type of stem cell I'll talk about is this one, which is, horrible name, mesenchymal stem cells, they're basically stem cells that you can extract from your bone marrow. And these stem cells <clears throat> are very interesting. You can get them from the bone marrow. They're your stem cells, they grow in the petri dish well, they can expand, but they don't make neurons. They don't make the motor neurons that die in the disease, and they don't make brain tissue. What they do is they make these interesting cells which have what we call anti-inflammatory effects in the body and they kind of release uh, different cytokines of drugs, uh, growth factors as well. And there's been a huge interest in both just blood transfusions in ALS and, and these uh, MSC cells. And, and Stan Appel has really pioneered the idea that you could maybe do a, trans a blood transplant from one patient, from a control patient into an ALS patient to see if it affects disease progression. And he tried that and unfortunately the outcomes weren't great. It didn't seem to work. So just a simple blood transfusion doesn't seem to be able to slow down the disease. Uh, he more recently has, a, I don't have it up here, a, a paper that maybe T cells, a certain type of white blood cell given to patients can actually slow disease progression. Um, and I should have put that up. Uh, that just was published recently. So there is now a, a type of blood cell that you put in and it seems to slow down the inflammation that you see in patients. And Stan Appel has shown nicely that that seems to be slowing disease progression. So that's very uh, encouraging. It's only a very small trial. We call it a phase two trial. And that needs to be confirmed in a larger phase three. As you know, the phase three is the one where many, many, unfortunately, trials fail in ALS. And lots of optimism at phase two. When you get to these bigger trials, they tend to fall apart, unfortunately. Um, on the bone marrow stem cell side, not blood cells, but actually bone marrow that you extract, there's been a number of uh, interesting trials uh, all around the world. I, this is out of date um, already. I'll just focus on this one very briefly. And uh, I think we have someone from Neuron. On the, on the call here is one of the clinicians involved. Neuron, as you know, is from a company called Brainstorm. They actually took mesenchymal cells out from the patient, they grow them in the Petri dish, and they add some magic factors, which is patented, we don't understand exactly what they are, but they're very interesting because they, they change these mesenchymal cells or these bone marrow cells to be more effective and, and they release more factors. Uh, and one of the factors they release is called GDNF, and I'm gonna come back to that in a second. And they find when they put these GDNF secreting modified cells back into the patient, into the, actually they put it into the fluid in the spinal cord so it gets into the circulation of the brain. They have some very interesting data um, from a phase two trial showing that the slope of progression is, is slowed when you put these cells back into the, into the lateral ventricles of the, of the brain. Now based on this fascinating data, they are in the middle, well, coming towards the end of a phase three trial. And I'm very excited to hear uh, the readout of that trial. And the phase three means blinded. It means half the patients did got cells and half the patients didn't get cells. And now we're going <clears> to <throat> see if the patients who got cells did better in a rather large trial. So that's very exciting. It's coming soon. Um, and we'll be able to uh, understand more about whether this therapy will work in about four or five months. None of these studies claim to replace neurons or astrocytes to support cells. They really work by releasing growth factors in the brain, uh, in, the spinal, in the spinal fluid, 
And very importantly, they seem to suck out bad things. And your spinal fluid, when you have ALS, has all bad things in it that are inflammatory. And these uh, stem cells that they put in, the mesenchymal cells, can actually soak up some of those factors and slow the disease progression, perhaps. But we need to wait for this final piece of data to prove that this uh, therapy is really effective. And, and again, we're all waiting with beta breath from this uh, phase three trials from Brainstorm. Happy to talk more about it uh, in, the, in the discussion period. This is really my last section of the talk, because I know on the East Coast, it's what, so it's bedtime. I, I go to bed about eight o'clock. <laughs> I have an 11 year old. <clears throat> um, so I really only have uh, uh, 10 minutes or so left. Um, so hang in there. Neural stem cells. And, and why are these so different? Well, I'm gonna go back to what I talked about at the beginning. They're very powerful neural stem cells. They, come from either embryonic stem cells or these induced pluripotent stem cells. So you're starting at the very beginning of development and now you're making what we call a neural progenitor cell, which is a cell that comes before the cells that make up your brain and spinal cord. And that means that cells in this sense can make all the neurons and oligodendrocytes and astrocytes, these three cell types that make up your nervous system. And we're obviously most interested in this guy, the motor neuron. So now I can actually make motor neurons, whereas the bone marrow cells can't make motor neurons. So this is a different thinking, uh, much more complicated, delivery is more complicated. And when I first got into this field, I thought, gee, we can just make a motor neuron and replace it. And after many years of trying, um, it was very difficult to actually put a motor neuron back into the spinal cord and make it connect to the muscle is very difficult. And I have yet to find anybody or any data shows that you can replace a motor neuron in an adult 60 year old patient. Maybe you can do it very early in development or in young mice and rats, not in, not in aged rats and mice. It's a hard, hard cell. I mean, eventually we may be able to, but right now we can't. In multiple sclerosis, this cell is dies, it's called the oligodendrocyte that myelinates all your axons. And that actually is an interesting technology. Uh, it's being used now for MS, where we make oligodendrocytes to remyelinate so that you replace the myelin. I'm not gonna talk about that. I'm going to talk about this cell, <clears throat> which is the astrocyte. The astrocyte is very interesting. It's a cell that sits around your motor neurons and protects them. It's like the nurse, the nurse that's looking after the motor neuron. If, without the astrocytes, motor neurons will die. So I figured a few years ago that this could be an interesting way of treating ALS, that we could replace the astrocytes because it's practical. We can make these progenitors. So motor neurons in the future, astrocytes, I figured now, and I figured now about seven or eight years ago. <laughs> the, the problem with using these though very powerful cells is with great power comes great responsibility. When you put them in the brain, they could make a teratoma, they could go crazy because they're so powerful, they proliferate so, so hard. So the FDA is very carefully monitoring using these cells in clinical trials. And it's been very slow for those to be used. They are starting to be used now, but it's very slow. So we took a different route. We had collected uh, fetal tissue a long time ago and the fetal tissue is less likely to make tumors, but still gives you these neural progenitors. So most of what I'm gonna show you now is, is based on fetal tissue. These are what these astrocytes look like in the spinal cord. Look how beautiful they are. They, these long red processes here, They're these stellate star-like cells that wrap around the motor neurons and protect them. This concept took me, uh, actually when I got to California, um, I wanted to do the clinical trial, but I'm not a company. Uh, it was going to be very expensive. It's going to be around $15 million to do a trial with just 18 patients. Uh, but fortunately, uh, CERN was here, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine. I was very fortunate. I had a lot of help from patient advocates. Um, we, we kind of pleaded at the grant review session to let us try this in ALS, and we got the grant through. We got the, the $16 million back in 2015-16, and that allowed us to do this, uh, what I think is an incredible trial. And just to really acknowledge up front the team, um, there were over 50 or 60 people involved with this clinical trial. Uh, I did uh, do it all at Cedar sinai but we had a lot of help um, from, from all the teams here. And just again, point out, this is my wife. And I don't know how my daughter snuck in here, but she did. I just noticed the other day. She must have, it was a few years ago we had this dinner, but I think she, uh, she's in there as well. So I'm going to go through now quickly the rationale, the logic for this trial. One is, um, this is the astrocyte I mentioned, and this is your motor neuron that connects to your muscle. And you can see beautiful connection. And when this motor neuron fires, your muscle moves, your leg moves or your arm moves. So we wanna keep that intact in ALS. But we know in ALS, it's not intact. It, the, the, the fiber withdraws from the muscle 
it starts to, these motor neurons start to die. And we also know from beautiful work from Don Cleveland and other labs that the astrocyte may be sick even before the motor neuron. So if you could replace the astrocyte, you could perhaps affect the course of the disease, providing you get in early enough and can then restore some normal function. And this is the, the goal is to put a new astrocyte in that I just talked about from fetal tissue derived progenitors and that that astrocyte can do a lot of interesting stuff. It can also seal up the blood brain barrier. It can interact with the neurons. And hopefully then, I'll play that again, you know, here we're not connected and we hope we can remain connected to the muscle and restore movement and keep movement uh, when you put these new astrocytes in. Now as a turbo boost, we did do some early experiments. I wasn't that happy with astrocytes on their own in these animal models. In a turbo boost, uh, we've engineered the cells now to make this growth factor called GDNF. Now GDNF is known to protect motor neurons. It's very powerful on its own. And in fact, uh, Neuron, uh, the, the brainstorm trial, uh, says that the cells that they put in in the brainstorm are making GDNF themselves. Well, we actually cheated. We, we used a, a virus to put this GDNF in, so we make bucket loads of GDNF. So now we've got a stem cell that's made a, a astrocyte, which is good on its own, and now it's secreting GDNF. This was a long road. First, we have to make the cells GMP. This means make it in, we have to produce those GDNF secreting cells in a facility that the FDA has approved. Then we have to do animal studies to show it's safe, and then we do an IND. IND means investigational new drug, and once you put that to the FDA, you're allowed to go ahead. The data from the animal studies is very encouraging. Red is the human cells we put in the spinal cord, and these big green cells here are the rat motor neurons, and you can see them here surviving because the red neural progenitor astrocytes are starting to form. Can you see them? All around the motor neurons. They've migrated and are circulating the motor neurons and protecting them. And now they're starting to put out these wonderful fibers. At the same time, they're making GDNF. We only put them on one side of the spinal cord. And look how the whole spinal cord of this rat is lighting up with GDNF because these cells are producing it. And critically, when we look at the number of surviving neurons, big here is good. If you have lots of neurons surviving, that's a good thing. This is in an animal that didn't receive the stem cell GDNF treatment. And these are in animals that did, and they have five or six times as many motor neurons surviving at the end of their disease as rats that didn't get it. And this was the basis for us moving forward to the clinical trial. We also had issues in the, in the preclinical data. Um, we actually saw these small growths, they're called neuromas, on the top of the spinal cord, which was to do with the GDNF being released. It wasn't part of the spinal cord, it was outside of it. But we, we reported this to the FDA and said this could be a possible side effect. Um, of the trauma, especially a big needle in a small mouse. And then finally, we did uh, larger animal studies, in this case, a pig. And you can see here the whole pig spinal cord with 10 sites, 10 injections of these cells, and they've survived and migrated in the spinal cord, and they look beautiful, and they're releasing GDNF all the way through the spinal cord. So all this data together told us that we didn't see the neuromas in the pig. Um, we can target these cells. They should mature into astrocytes. And the interesting thing here, guys, is this is a one and done. In other words, once we put the cells into your spinal cord, they'll make GDNF for free for life, and they'll survive longer than the patient because they're young astrocytes that have a 100-year lifespan <laughs> once they're in and integrated, theoretically. Um, so, so this is a kind of interesting therapy in that it's invasive, and I'll show you in a moment, because you have to do surgery to get the cells in, but you only have to do it once. So we did all that work and now we filed the IND. Uh, this is the, the uh, document that we submitted. There's four copies. It was six and a half thousand pages because we had to interact with gene therapy regulators, device regulators. We, we developed a new device to inject it into the spinal cord, stem cell regulators. And so I was busy for a long time. My wife actually is an editor in my lab and she was the only one who read it top to bottom. And um, so uh, it was a family effort uh, and, and a lot of help from a lot of different colleagues to get that out. And in 2016, October, we got approval from the FDA. <clears throat> and this is the trial. It was a very early a phase two single blinded trial. Um, we had two groups, a low dose and then a high dose. We did full suppression in these patients. So they got immunosuppression as if they were having a kidney transplant. We wanted to make sure the cells didn't reject because this is a fetal product, neuroprogenitive product, product that isn't directly matched to the patient. And the unique design was actually, uh, it was unilateral. We only put the cells into one side of the patient. 
on the right or the left side so that we would only see an effect on either the left leg or right leg. And we consented the patients very carefully. We said, this is not going to cure your ALS. But boy, if we see an effect on the side that we put the cells, it's going to open up lots of possibilities for moving to the other side and to different regions to affect the arms and ultimately the brain. And I'll get to that at the end. So we were very excited to get this approved by the FDA. They actually forced us to do legs first because if it was damaging and nobody's ever done this before with GDNF cells, we wanted to, to, to reduce the risk. And so we, we do the first 18 patients in the lumbar region affecting only the legs. Primary outcome is safety. Was it safe? Could we put these cells in, which is quite invasive and, and have a safe profile in patients? And at the same time, we focused on um, some of these, what we call secondary measures, which the main one is this atlas testing, which means testing your muscle leg strength in each leg over time. Actually, we dosed the first patient on May 3rd, 2017, after getting all our approvals. This was a nerve wracking uh, operation, but uh, Pat Johnson, the neurosurgeon uh, seen here was amazing. Um, and the surgery went very well, the patient uh, recovered. And this is the surgical team that were involved in that first patient. This is after the last patient. <laughs> you see, we're all a lot more relaxed because we had now done it 18 times successfully. Um, and again, this is Pablo Avalos, who was really key um, to, to making this all work, and Pat Johnson, who was the key neurosurgeon. And you saw Bob Baylor earlier, who was the one who was a neurologist, who was in, enrolling all of the patients. So it was quite, quite the team. We've now finished the trial. Uh, it was 18 patients. They're subject 0, 1, 101 here to, to 018. Um, and, you know, this is ALS. And uh, unfortunately, we've lost nine patients in this trial, and we have nine still surviving. Um, the first patient, as I said, was done in 2017. The uh, protocol was for one year follow-up. And so we reached the end of the year for the last patient um, uh, about six months ago, and we're now um, analyzing uh, an enormous amount of data. And the main thing we're looking at is this uh, chair that the patient sits in to measure the leg strength. And we've shown already that in ALS, it's interesting, both legs tend to progress at the same speed. So if the cells are gonna work, you'll see one leg slow down because we normally would see both progressing together. Now, if one slows down, that's the outcome we're interested in. And the power of statistically looking at that is very great. And we're, we're excited to sort of analyze that data. So we rolled all patients, there's no complications with the injections. It was simple and effective uh, to use. So we hope this device is gonna be used in subsequent trials. Uh, the study has met its primary endpoint, which was safety. Um, we're not officially finished yet. Um, but we had no adverse effects to uh, report. There was transient pain after the injection and that subsides in most patients. And so this primary endpoint will be met. Uh, uh, fascinating and very importantly, every patient who came to postmortem, we collected the tissues in the spinal cord and we found transplants in every single patient that were releasing GDNF in the spinal cord. Uh, that in itself is amazing and very exciting and very hopeful for us moving forward. And the, the reason I can't show you the whole data set is we were locking it all down before we can formally submit this. And then COVID hit in March and we've been delayed because they haven't been able to travel here and close out all of the data sets we've captured. So we've been waiting six months. Um, but finally, I think in the next couple of months, we should be able to close it. And we have the paper written and everything ready to roll after we confirm all of the data is correct. We wouldn't want to put anything out there until we've checked. And this is typical of a clinical trial. You have to close it down and lock it before you publish. The last few minutes, um, we think about moving forward. Uh, we've already talked about this with, uh, with our IRB here. Uh, we know that we went late in these patients. And so we're now setting out to do another three patients. We're gonna go earlier in the progression in the leg because we know we need to go as early as possible. And in fact, we might go in the leg before it's even started. Patients who are starting in the arms but have no leg effect will go in with these cells and they should stop or slow down the progression if it's working. We were targeting a little high, so we're going to go deeper to get more into the area that had the motor neurons. And we're just going to focus on this uh, muscle strength outcome, which has been very, very useful, very reliable. Um, it was actually used in a, in, a, in a recent clinical trial just published, actually, uh, in New England Journal of Medicine um, that, <clears throat> that, that found it also very stable and very useful. But, you know, ALS is not just a disease of the lumbar spinal cord. This is where we did our injections. Um, all the way up, that's, that's, that's for the, limb, the leg muscles. 
up here in your cervical cord, that's where you have breathing and that's where you, you control your arm muscles. And of course, that's a crucial area that we'd like to target next. And we have data to show in animals that it works beautifully, but we actually see better effects when we put the cells there functionally in animals. Um, but that's a very dangerous area to put cells in because of all these interesting regions which are to do with uh, other, other types of essential brain function. So we have to be very careful, but we do think we are able to go into the cervical spinal cord and affect breathing. And then more interestingly to me is this top area, which is uh, the cortical area. Now the cortical area, um, this is where you initiate movement. And I have a feeling that ALS probably, just my hunch and hypothesis, maybe starts in the upper motor neurons in the cortex and then spreads down to the rest of the body. So this area is uh, the last part I'm gonna focus on. And we really have shown through a number of studies that if we put cells into that motor cortex, the cells survive and they slow down progression in a rat model of ALS. It's just the paper was published two years ago. And so we know that that region is very uh, sensitive and responds to the stem cell implantation and the GDNF release very well. And so now, of course, uh, we're going to focus on, on that in the next trial. And this is already uh, moving forward. The remarkable thing with your motor cortex, guys, you might not know this, it's fascinating. This is my favorite slide, is that you have a homunculus. And the homunculus means your motor cortex strip, which is here in your brain, mirrors all of your arms and legs and limbs. So as you go here, this is a, a going around your cortex. This part up here controls your toes, ankle, and knee. And then as you move around, move down this, this pink area in your brain, which is re represented all the way around here, this hand area is hugely represented in the cortex, and it's actually it's called a hand knob right here. And then further down, you've got facial area, that, the motor neurons that control the face. So all of these control different parts of the body in a very sequential way. So in our trial, we're gonna actually just focus putting the cells in around where the hand knob is so that we can see if the cells mod moderate hand function. And then we're gonna be testing the patients with a nine hole peg test to see if the function of the hand over time is affected. Um, and we're just gonna do that on one side of the brain again to see if the cells are integrating and having an effect or slowing progression of the loss of the use of the hand. So I think this is a very exciting uh, movement forward. We just had this, the study has been uh, approved um, and we're <clears throat> gonna be using Rich Lewis for that study, who's another MD here, neurologist, uh, and Adam Amalak, who's the uh, neurosurgeon who focuses on uh, the brain. We have all the safety study um, and we just had our IB approved, approved. We would be starting already, except for COVID, we're not allowed to do any uh, clinical studies right now because it involves immunosuppression. So as soon as our numbers get below seven per 100,000, uh, we are triggered and ready to go for this trial, um, which again, will, this one will be actually uh, 18 patients in, in three different groups. So we're very excited to get that going. This is really, uh, I think my last message is a marathon. You can't rush, unfortunately, these kind of complex experiments. It's a marathon. We probably, to get full effect, will need to do a cortical, a lumbar, and a cervical. We'll target those three areas. Neurosurgeons love to do surgery. And again, it's one surgery, and then it's over. You go home, and you don't have to come in again. Um, and so that's kind of the long-term strategy. But we had to do one thing at a time and work our way up to that. This was an enormous collaborative project. Um, the, the, the amount of collaboration here at Cedar sinai I, I, I start almost crying when I'm thinking about the amount of work this took and the amount of effort. I was a sponsor. We didn't have a company, um, but Cedar sinai is like a company and they're so passionate about ALS here. The clinic here is amazing. The staff are amazing. And somehow we pulled this off um, and we're now gonna continue moving along carefully, cautiously, uh, but optimistically. And of course, the 18 patients who took part in this trial, I'd like to thank the most. They were completely consented that this wasn't going to save them. And one patient described it to me at a meeting once, well, Clive, I know this is going to help me. I see ALS, I see all these closed doors, and the answer's behind one of them. And, I, and he said, I'm going to open this one, and I'm going to go through it. I'm going to see if it's the right answer. And he said, "If leave the door open. If it doesn't work, we've, we've now answered another question, that's not the right door, but at least who's coming behind me only has five doors to choose instead of six. And I think that's a good way to look at this, uh, that we have to keep testing we, until we know the cause, maybe from the IPS modeling, we'll get more information on the cause and then we can focus. But until that time, these kind of stem cell approaches can be very powerful because they're broader in their effect and they may well have, have an effect in patients, but we have to be honest and ask the question, does it work? 
and not bias yourself to want it to work. <laughs> of course I want it to work, but look at the results, take it to the next level honestly, and, and make decisions based on the results to your, to your experiment. I'm a scientist formally, and that's all we do is we ask questions. Uh, we've learned an awful lot from this trial, um, and uh, we're looking forward to moving forward. So Indu, I will stop there and uh, obviously take questions. Thank you so much. This was, this was probably one of the really, really good presentations I've seen about stem cells and you walked us through really beautifully. So um, we have a um, bunch of questions here that were sent. Uh, if you don't mind, um, both Sarah and Tara uh, both will um, go through the questions with you. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, all right. So the first question comes from Dr. Narula and the question has, says, we sent you a couple of articles, which I'm about to put in the chat so that other people can read them too, um, that have to do with neural stem, stem cells based on the shared articles with human subjects. Have you thought about changing over to human subjects with the neural stem cells? And if yes, what are the results if the trials have been done? And if not, why not? Well, I'm trying to remember the two papers. I did have a quick look this afternoon. I know one of them was taking um, Presence of adult neural stem cells in the mammalian central nervous system and human motor neurons generated from neural stem cells delay clinical onset and prolong life in ALS and mouse model. So there's two projects, that's right. So the, let's take the, the second one, or the first one first. They, they put motor neurons back into a mouse model, mouse motor neurons back into a mouse model and saw some functional effects where the mouse model has SOD1, so the mouse gets ALS, and they saw a small, sh a small slowing in the progression of the disease when they put these motor neurons in. Now the point with that paper and many other papers like it is they didn't show that the motor neurons had made connection to the muscle, but it could be that that pool of motor neurons that they put in had some astrocytes and other cell types that secreted factors that protected the motor neurons that were in the mouse. I think we all agree in the field that's probably the mechanism that they were looking at. They weren't looking at reconnection, they were looking at, again, a trophic effect. Um, the, second, the second paper was adult stem cells. They took cells from the ventricular patient, adult patients, and managed to get them to grow. You can do that. It's very, very, uh, and these cells, there are, there are areas of the brain that actually still have cells dividing. There's one in the hippocampus, and we all have cells that divide in the hippocampus. And in fact, that's a form of memory. And those cells divide and keep your memories going. Very important in Alzheimer's disease. And in fact, there were some taxi drivers in England. If everyone's been to London, many years ago. I think now they probably always GPS on. Actually, that's not true. They still do the knowledge. They had to know every street in London. And those taxi drivers, when they looked at their brain, had a bigger hippocampus than, you know, normal people who weren't taxi drivers because they had to learn the knowledge. It was remarkable. It's a paper in nature. So if you use a part of the brain like the hippocampus, you get cells dividing and they grow. But there's only two regions in the brain that do that, the hippocampus and one part deep in the striatum called the subventricular zone, and that produces cells that migrate down into the nose, nose region of the brain, actually, the nasal uh, area. All the rest of the brain doesn't, has no proliferating cells, really, very small numbers. And yes, you can pull those out of an adult, but they're very difficult to grow. Much easier to get them from other tissues, like iPS cells or fecal tissue. Is there an age cutoff at which stem cell treatments are no longer beneficial? Did you notice a difference in the GDNF cells working based on age of the patient, which relates to the age of their stem cells? Yeah, and the answer is no. We, don't, we, we didn't see any differences in the survival of the cells and the release of GDNF based on the age of the patient. It seems like they are working equally well in terms of surviving. Now, unfortunately, and I wish this was not true, there is no effective stem cell therapy for ALS that's been proven yet. Now, once they have that, then they can say, now, did it, was it better in young oil people? But right now, as of today, as far as I know, there isn't an approved stem cell treatment for ALS. There's lots of trials going on, but nothing approved. So we can't do that correlation yet. Once we get something working in young people, we can ask, does it work in older people as well? For all of our patients on tonight, we have a, always get the common question, for the trials that happen after COVID, what is the easiest way if people want to get involved in these trials? Well, I think <clears throat> um, it's going to be independent. In, each institution has their own rules and regulations on, on, on this. Uh, Cedar sinai has its own set of rules. Uh, we are opening up trials again that were closed. Um, but I have to say each state is different. <laughs> each, 
each each institution is different. And so you just have to go to your local hospital and look at your local, talk to your local uh, neurologist to, to find out what the activity is in that particular clinical trial. And there's no one rule fits all at the moment. There, there are some places that are opening up completely and others that are completely not doing any clinical trials. And until we get out of this mess, uh, we're gonna be in a transition period. So, so go ask your neurologist. Uh, some trials are still enrolling. I think neuro, Neuron managed to enroll a, a slowly through this period, but they did slow down and now they're getting up to speed again. So everybody's in a different boat depending on what part of the country you're in. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is, this type of therapy requires surgery, correct? correct? Many of us are unable to receive general anesthesia due to poor FVC. Have you worked with patients with poor respiratory systems? We haven't, we haven't in, our, in our protocol, we had patients with a, with a certain threshold of FCCs, forced vital capacity. So they weren't in that critical end stage. And mainly because we wanna, this therapy is gonna work best slightly earlier in the disease, not later because it's a protective therapy. You're trying to protect the existing motor neurons from dying. So we didn't run into that issue. The patients, some of them were down 30, 40% on their forced vital capacity and they handled the surgery fine in the anesthetic. Uh, once you get below a threshold, then you can't have surgery in anesthetic anymore. It's much, much riskier. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, if, we, if this works, if we see some function, and especially in the ongoing studies, we might then say, well, the risk of the anesthetic is worth it <laughs> given that this might actually reactivate some of your motor neurons. So that's going to be a, a risk assessment because you can anesthetize any patient. It's just the risk goes up the lower your vent, forced ventral, ventral capacity. So it, it's a complicated mix. Thank you. So can you please explain the four types and are there any biomarkers for each individual subcategory? All right, that was a hypothetical four types and I wish it was that simple. Uh, right now, it's, there is one type of ALS um, generally speaking. Now, having said, so this was what we hope. We, we hope from Answer ALS we'll find four subtypes you know, based on some molecular marker. So we can say, well, you're type A, B, C. Clinically, there are definitely different subtypes of ALS, right? There's, there's what's called an upper predominant ALS where your upper motor neurons are dying. And that is more of a kind of uh, dystonia kind of rigidity that you get. And then there's a lower, which is more flaccid. Your muscles get flaccid very quickly. And the neurologist will tell you, you mainly upper or you mainly lower. So there are subtypes within patients. And in fact, we're going to use those subtypings to look at the molecular analysis as well. So we're going to try and correlate it with some of the clinical subtypes. Some patients go very fast. Other patients go very slowly. There's two more subtypes. Maybe that uh, is dividing the patients. And the, the fast progressor should be getting one drug and the slow another one. So we're gonna use all the tools we have to understand from the clinical side and the molecular side when we've got these different subtypes. But the colors were really just colors. <laughs> we're, we're hoping that they will be real. And we had a green patient with a green drug that would be great. What are your thoughts about the brainstem and bulbar function? Is there a similar part of the brain for bulbar functions? Well, bulbar, you know, is more for swallowing and reflexive uh, and, and, and this area um, and uh, the, the name of the, like bulbar onset ALS is, means it's more up here. Um, and, and then as you go down the spinal cord, you get different types of ALS. Um, and it's really just defining it based on the, on the clinical syndrome. And it's really interesting in ALS, it's very random where you get it. It's, it's not like every patient gets it in the same place. But unfortunately, as we all know, it always seems to spread. And there's some ideas that, from John Rabbits and others that the spread is actually uh, some sort of infectious agent so you get it in the bulbar region in your neck here, and then it spreads next to your arms, and then it spreads to your legs. But half patients do that, and then the other half don't seem to do that. Some can get it in their big toe, and then they get it in their finger a week later. And, and so we don't, we all have ideas, but testing these ideas is showing that there's all different varieties of ALS, unfortunately. I wish it was more simple, but you know, maybe when we look at that more, like say we took the patients who it seems to spread in, and said that's one group, and then the ones where it's random, and it, maybe there's a different cause for those two types of ALS, and we'll discover that, and we'll find a drug that is different for those two types of ALS. The different types of stem cells, are amniotic stem cells more potent than umbilical cord blood? Umbilical cord cells are probably, you know, they're the younger cells, so, so those are the ones, as you know, when you have your baby, they, they, take, the, they, take, the, they take the umbilical cord off, and then they they kind of angle it and shake it and they drip all the umbilical cord blood cells out. 
and those are, are, are very young. And I think the problem is there's only so many of them, you know, unless you have five babies at <laughs> once. If you have sex or triplets, I guess you'll get a lot of cord blood, um, but there's only a limited amount. So they're interesting, they're limited, and they're more like in the zone, I talked about the mesenchymal cells, they're more a kind of general stem cell that might be an anti-inflammatory, but they're not gonna make neurons. They're not gonna make astrocytes in the brain. So that's, that's in this category of cells, which maybe if you infuse them into the blood, these young embryonic, uh, these, these young umbilical stem cells could have a clinical effect. And there are some trials going on trying to use those to see if they do have a clinical effect in ALS. Building off of that, how do you know if stem cells are in good quality? Well, we do a very, very rigorous manufacturing process. And that's where some of these charlatans are, uh, are terrible because we have to go through a lot of hoops with the FDA to make sure we have everything sterile, it's clean, it's, that the product that we produce, the stem cell product, is real and it's been tested and validated. And so we have a lot of testing. That 6,000 page document I showed you, about 2,000 pages of that was describing how we grow the cells and how we make them. So that's, that's uh, the key. FDA needs to approve it and they're here to help. They're not, people say FDA is slowing things down. They're actually here to protect you guys from the charlatans. And if you get it through the FDA and they will help you through, it costs money. And you, you, this is why these foundations like yours are so important. Um, they've qualified it and now we know at least it's safe to go into the patient. So as long as you do that, it's fine. If you have a company that you go off the internet and go visit them, they'll say, yeah, I'm gonna cure your ALS with stem cells. You know, maybe ask them, well, where do they come from? How did you isolate them? How long were they grown? And if they, if they say, well, you don't need to know any of that, don't worry, they're, they're great. They're the best stem cells you can ever get. Uh, and then they follow it up with that's $40,000, thank you. That's when you need to think seriously about what they're offering. Um, but if they come up with like, you know what, this has been processed, we got FDA approval, this is a great clinical trial, and it's free, because clinical trials generally are sponsored by the company, I'm all in, understanding if, if these stem cells can try and work. Thank you. Uh, just to follow up on that, this is really difficult for patients. I'm not clever enough to know if there, there may be a therapy out there somewhere using a certain different type of stem cell. And so it's a, it's a difficult call for me. Uh, for instance, in Korea, you can, there's a group doing mesenchymal cell transplants in Korea that's getting some nice results. They've published their data, looks quite optimistic. Um, and occasionally patient will come back from a trip to Switzerland and say, I had the stem cell treatment and it seems to work. And it's very hard to untangle, unfortunately, the people who do those transplants don't want you to really analyze the patients. Why? Because if it's shown not to work, they're not going to get patients coming to them. <laughs> and so they kind of don't want people to know. They just want to, you know, get more patients to come. It's a bit like PRP for my knee. I, I, I know it really doesn't work, but I do it because I think it might work. And that's, your, that's what they're playing off is the stem cell word is very powerful, but we have to be realistic. And I don't want people paying money for something that is just making somebody else rich off of your your, your, off of your disease, which is just not it's intolerable. For future trials, is there a way that patients could get involved or advocate um, so that we can see more stem cell trials, as well as why do you believe there are so few? I believe there's so few stem cell trials because it's so complicated. It, it's, a, it's not an, if you produce a small white drug, <laughs> you give it to the patient and they get better, that model has been around for years. Drug companies know how to manufacture those. They can make it for 10 cents. They can sell it for $100. That is a brilliant, and they give it every day to the patient. It's a model that we've been using in, in pharma for years. If I, if I told pharma, oh, I'm going to make a stem cell therapy, it's going to cost you millions of dollars to develop it. It might work. Um, and they, and they're, they're not used to that model. It's scary because they don't, first, they don't know if it's really going to work, but they have to invest so much up front. Um, in, in, in applying it. And then it's hard to sometimes say, well, if, if, I, if you put the cells in and it cures a the patient, then you know, how am I going to keep making money, <laughs> right? It's a one-time cure. So then you have to charge an enormous amount up front like they have for gene therapy. The, the most expensive drug in the world is called Zol Zolgesma from, um, from Avexis, Novartis. It's $3 million a shot. And, and the reason is, it's a uh, gene therapy product that makes this uh, a protein for the rest of the life of that kid. And so they, can ch they charge up front for the downstream time when they would have been charging for pills. 
for that patient. So it is a new model. We're trying to get to grips with it. And, you know, we've, I think the neuron uh, trial is very important because that's the biggest mesenchymal stem cell trial we've ever done in ALS. And if that's positive, you'll see uh, some floodgates opening and the ability that may be the first one that we actually get approved by the FDA. It, I, I can tell you now it's not a cure for ALS, honestly. It's going to have a, an effect on the progression. I wish it was, but it's clearly from all the data, it's not a cure, but it will be better maybe or the same as a Deverone and Rilazole, but it's at least it's another weapon that we can add. And who knows, in combination with a Deverone and Rilazole, maybe there's something good. Um, but realistically, unfortunately, um, I, I, it's not a cure right now. From, from what we can see from the preclinical data, but it, we'll see. I see how, how strong the effect is in a bigger group of patients. Very exciting. Thank you. Um, you mentioned in your presentation that this is a one and done surgery. Would multiple treatments of stem cells help in theory with increased success with therapy? Yeah, I mean, so I'm, I'm very excited about our approach because we're replacing those astrocytes and they're making GDNF. And if, if we can get the targeting right and we get the dose right, you know, potentially we could stop the disease in its tracks. That's why I'm doing this. <laughs> I don't want to get you excited. And I'm British, you know, so I'm always dismal. No, it's never going to work. I came to America, my wife's American. She's always saying, oh, you're so grumpy and dismal about stuff. Well, I just want to be realistic about what we're trying to do here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a disease, it's very tricky. But if I put my American cap on, say, wow, if this works, it is a one and done. You put the cells in, they make new cells, they secrete GDNF and they'll protect your motor neurons for the rest of your life. And if we can prove that, this could be a one and done therapy and, and if we just get past that threshold of showing that they're, they're effective, and I think that's going to take a couple more trials, then uh, we can press the go button. And, you know, I'll tell you another example is, is deep brain stimulation. If anybody's got a relative with Parkinson's, you might, have, you might know they, they actually put an electrode in the brain and they've done, and that stimulates and it allows you to move in Parkinson's disease and gets rid of your tremor. It's an amazing surgery. It's called DBS. And when that started about 15 years ago and, and small uh, lab in, in France, everybody said they were crazy. Who's gonna have surgery? Who's gonna do that? And there was all this debate. I went to meeting after meeting. You know, and, oh, Benavid has started. He said, don't waste your time, it's surgery. Now it's the mainstream treatment for Parkinson's, for, for tremor. We do at our hospital here, you know, over 30 cases uh, in some weeks, every week. There's been thousands of patients. Neurosurgeons love to do neurosurgery <laughs> and they're very good at it. And it's, it shouldn't be that scary because it's a one-time surgery. And once you're done, you leave the hospital and every patient of ours got out in five days and we're back home. So, you know, it, it is possible to have a surgical technique that's widespread. Look at DBS, but we, we need to prove it works first. When you talk about the um, surgery being the way that's implanted, we have some patients that may have ports for other reasons. Is there another way to instill those stem cells besides a surgery for those patients that may have a bulbar onset and can't undergo a surgery due to their anesthesia um, inabilities? Right now, no. I mean, the, 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 the key that we found is people have tried to put these cells in the spinal fluid, which is easier. You don't need uh, to, to have the full surgery for that or anesthetize because you can do it in a lumbar puncture. They don't work. They don't, it, we need to get the cells into the spinal cord or into the cortex in the brain tissue. And, that, and that's crucial for the cells to actually get into the brain. If you don't, then they just float around the outside of the brain and they can't do anything. So no, we have to unfortunately do a surgical approach. Next question, um, does the damage to astrocytes and oligodendrocytes um, proceed or occur concurrently to the damage to the mo motor neurons? Oh, that's a nice question. That's gotta be uh, somebody in the science field, I think. Um, it's a great question. I wish we knew exactly which, which was first, the chicken and the egg. Um, I mean, the, the astrocytes, maybe they get sick first and then they lead to the motor neurons dying. Uh, or it could be the, neuron, the motor neuron itself that triggers the astrocytes to get re reactive. I don't know. One thing we are doing with this IPS models, that, of course, every, whenever I give this talk, whenever I do the clinical trial last, nobody ever asked me about IPS cells and disease modeling. <laughs> we all get excited about the trial. I'm going to do it the other way around next time. Um, but that modeling, I didn't tell you, we can actually then, <clears throat> once we create the model, we can look at the motor neurons and the astrocytes differently and ask which one had the problem. Was it the motor neuron or was it the astrocyte that had the disease signature? That might tell us which started the, the disease. And we're very excited in answer ALS, we might get that information 
by looking more carefully in the, in the, in the, in the petri dish at which cell starts the initiating process. You've brought up neuron and some, a lot of our patients are asking about, you've talked about these different facilities inside it out and you know, your thoughts on the money. Um, but a question coming, if something comes out of the results in November, do you think this will change the way that um, stem cells are being studied? And do you think that this will be available more easily to patients if um, it turns out that there is a positive outcome? Well, it would be just like a Deveron and like Rilazol um, and this new drug that, that uh, I mentioned in the New England Journal of Medicine. I've lost the name of it now. Is it um, Hindu? What's that new one? Amelix. Amelix. Thank you. Yes. Uh, and and they're speaking on October 14th on our webinar. So those three, which are kind of in the same category, um, you know, if, big if, if Neuron gets approved by the FDA, so they see an effect, it gets licensed, um, you know, essentially then if insurance will cover that for patients, so it'll be part of your standard of care and uh, providing the insurers are going to pay it. If it's FDA approved, then they kind of obliged to, right? So that'll become part of the standard of care. If, if the FDA don't approve it, but they, they say, well, it's still interesting and it's, it's safe, then you get into this whole right to try um, emergency use uh, area. And that, that's something that we could talk about for hours, but uh, it's very complicated on both sides. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's, if it's a positive result, you know, we can, we can get this as, a, as a, another line of defense. So when you see a neurologist, they're gonna say, do you want Rilazol? Do you want um, the Amlex drug? Do you want the Deveron? Or do you want a stem cell treat, you know, the neuron? I mean, hopefully it might be in one of those categories. But let's wait and see. We don't know yet. Our last question, a uh, patient that's asking, for someone not being treated at Cedar, can they apply to participate in this next trial that's getting ready to start? If so, who do we contact? Thank you, yes. Well, you, you can contact me. Um, we try to keep it local, because all of you guys know how difficult it is to travel long distances. So for all of the testing that we do, uh, we are limiting it to patients in the LA basin and this area. Um, as soon as we get bit further on, we're going to open it to a multi-site trial, which will probably be a couple of sites on the East Coast and a couple on the West Coast. So we're very excited to take this to the next stage, guys. And I think, you know, with Neuron coming through, our trial now reading out very soon, it's going to generate a lot of stem cell excitement. Uh, the hope is there, guys. I mean, um, you just have to keep your fingers crossed that the, the science gods help us, <laughs> that these cells do integrate and start taking. We have nine patients who are still alive in our trial that we're still following and are interested to see how the cells continue to react in the spinal cord and we're still following their function. Um, so we have a lot more to come from our trial and moving to the cortex, I think, is where we'll see hopefully the most exciting results because I feel like you can do everything you want in the spinal cord, but if, the, if you can't initiate the movement, it's not gonna work. So we have to put the cells probably in the motor cortex to allow you to continue using your hands. So yeah, I'm very, very obviously, I'm an optimist and uh, looking forward to uh, the next year or two, get out of this COVID fog and uh, get moving again. Um, and I'm here, you know, I'm doing all this for you guys and uh, we'll keep working hard and be careful. And I, I honestly, I'm not saying if you, if you really want to know, I, I'm happy to take emails and if you are getting approached by a stem cell company, I work pretty closely with the FDA. And to be honest, one, one email from me and the FDA can go in and investigate. And uh, I think we need to do that as a community. I think if these people are allowed to continue preying on this kind of disease, it's not going to stop. And by sending it to me, again, I'm for you. If, it might be that you send it to me, I'm like, oh my God, they've got something. They had five patients who recovered. Look, it could happen, right? What they normally do though, is they show the one patient who you know, recovered, and then there's six others who had horrible side effects who they don't mention. So they've got to be transparent got to be real. And if I found a company, I don't care what it's called or where it's from, that had something, I would know very quickly. I've seen enough to know. And boy, I'm excited. Yeah, I'll support it. I'll try and get some money and let's, let's see if that really works in, in more patients, right? So, that, so let's keep an open mind. And if you send me, you know, things you find on the internet, man, I wish I would said that. It could be a thousand emails tomorrow. Um, but I think it's up to me and others to I might start tweeting soon. I might go on Twitter. I've, I've avoided it because I didn't really know what it was until my son showed me. So maybe we can have a, a, a Twitter account that people can, you know, put comments in and say, Clive, you know, or whoever, experts, does this stem cell therapy, you know, is it worth having? And I'll try and give you an honest 
an honest readout, or if I can't, I'll talk to my colleagues so I know people that you've all heard from, Merit and Jeff. We should really have a consortium to protect you from charlatans, but not be overbearing and saying, oh, we know better than anybody else, but let's look at the data that they're producing. So it's not going to be like, let's kill this. It's going to be like, let's understand this. And maybe there's some uh, nugget in there that, we're, that we don't want to miss. That's a great idea, Clive. That's a great idea. We want to thank you very much for coming and talking with us tonight. This was a wonderful presentation, very informative, but also we got a lot of questions answered. Um, I want to also say thank you to everyone that has came out tonight and heard a big unveiling of Caring ALS. We will be sending both the information that uh, Dr. Svetson shared with us, as well as all the links for Caring ALS um, through our email that you guys usually get um, after these presentations, as well as I'll share the links in the chat again. Mm -hmm.